it is. Right now, within the end of the month, uh, a state law that's required mandatory boat inspections is going to run out. That's right. And you folks not only would like to see that renewed, but expanded. Indeed. Uh, renewal is first job, but I think uh, we'd really love to see uh, them make it stronger by requiring boats to be decontaminated before they're launched in the Adirondacks. Now we know there are 11,000 lakes and ponds out there. Uh, certainly not all of those have public launches on them, but uh, there are enough places that this becomes a big job. But it's one that the state can handle. Uh, decontamination takes very little equipment. Uh, it's really a pressure washer and a hot water tank and uh, it can be done by almost anybody with a little bit of training. So we think that uh, getting stations established around the park won't be the hard part. Uh, the hard part will be making sure the state is willing to pay for it. And it's certainly a lot cheaper than trying to deal with the consequences of introducing invasive species like the spiny water flea and the Eurasian milfoil over and over and over again in those 11,000 uh, ponds and, and lakes two lakes it's been mandatory, uh, Loon Lake and Lake George. And it's working well. Yeah, I was going to ask you, have they successfully thwarted invasives, in their opinion, from coming in by having those inspections or having those washing stations? They have not discovered new infestations. They have discovered that they have prevented thousands of infestations that could have occurred. Uh, so yeah, we see that as a big success story. and we. We congratulate the folks on Lake George and the monumental task of getting multiple towns and a couple of counties together to get that job done. Uh, certainly Warren and Essex County don't always work hand in glove uh, and the towns had to cooperate along with the Adir uh, Adirondack Park Agency, the Lake George Park Commission and the fund for Lake George has done a lot to, to help promote and make this happen too. So we're really grateful that all of those folks have done that. At Loon Lake, it's really been the town of Chester and Fred Monroe who's overseen that uh, transformation of how they deal with boats there. He's done a terrific job, really has. We talked briefly about the budget, the state budget. This year's budget passed uh, back in, in early April. What in it is good for the environment and, and for the Adirondacks and what in it is, well, let's start with that. What in right. it is good uh, uh, for the Adirondacks? We saw another 500 million appropriated for grants for water and sewer projects. That's good because we have a lot of small communities in the Adirondacks that need multi-million dollar upgrades to their sewer systems and uh, sewage treatment plants. They can't afford to do it on their own. But they're protecting everybody's water when they do. So the state could and should put a little bit of money up to make sure that those communities do the job well and uh, save us all the trouble of having polluted rivers downstream. Uh, Another thing was the Adirondack Diversity Initiative. And this may not seem like an environmental uh, issue, but it really is an environmental justice issue and one where about 90 to 95% of the park's population is white and uh, that leaves an impression on people even if it's not intentional. And it also puts us in a position where we get used to talking to one another and aren't always comfortable when people of color come into the conversation. And that's a problem for a place that depends on tourism and hospitality for its daily bread. Uh, and it's a problem for a place that is owned by every one of the 19 and a half million New Yorkers who live in this state and who are entitled to treat it as uh, the forest preserve as their own possession, mm -hmm. uh, because it is. So. How we make the park more welcoming has always been a challenge. Over the last five years, uh, not-for-profit organizations have gotten together to create the Adirondack Diversity Initiative. And this was really an attempt to work together to uh, get the conversation started of how we can spend more time uh, among a diverse group of people who will teach us things about ourselves and one another and learn how we can get along better and make this place a more welcoming place for everybody. You know, if folks aren't coming to live here and aren't coming to visit here, there's a reason for that. And we want to understand what that is and see what we can do to fix that. And it's that simple. So uh, we had been hoping that the state would provide some help and over the last couple of years had been lobbying the legislature to either provide some money to coordinate this effort 
or do the training themselves, provide the anti-bias training for state employees that work in the park and for hospitality workers who are at hotels and motels and uh, restaurants and other businesses in the park. Well, that sounded like a great idea, but again, there was no money. So uh, this year, we hired an additional lobbyist on top of the folks that we work with regularly on our staff and uh, got out and sold the idea to the entire legislature instead of just the leaders and the governor's office. That brought enough momentum to the issue that we got an appropriation of $250,000 for a new coordinator. Now, the Adirondack Council would love to host this person in our offices, but we don't take public money. Uh, we're entirely privately funded so that we can remain an independent uh, critic of government's actions. Mm -hmm. So we're working with a partner, uh, the Adirondack North Country Association, which does take government grants, and they will uh, provide a host facility in uh, Saranac Lake, uh, provide office space and equipment for the coordinator, and the grant will go through ANCA, and they will uh, be working on uh, putting together an advisory board and hiring this coordinator over the next few months, I would expect. So anybody who's interested in uh, getting involved in that process really ought to talk to the Adirondack North Country Association, and I know that they're gathering information and ideas on that right now. Included in the budget was the ban on plastic bags beginning next March. It was. That was great. And uh, we're happy to see that they did not follow through with the plan to ban paper bags as well. Uh, we didn't see those as equivalent um, and believe the paper industry uh, could maybe use a little bit of a boost in the, in the Northeast. But uh, uh, more importantly, the uh, paper bags don't leave the kind of uh, lingering residue in the environment that the plastic bags do and uh, have not become the uh, disposal problem or the litter problem that uh, plastic bags have. So um, uh, we're thrilled to see that re reusable bags will be the norm, uh, but that paper will still be around too. Uh, the APA is meeting this week, taking up a couple of uh, uh, hot button issues. Uh, one would be uh, whether to approve a zip line uh, for the ski jumps in Lake Placid. Uh, have you folks taken a, a position on that? We have. Uh, it's not our first choice of what they ought to be doing on the Olympic Regional Development Authority property, but not particularly illegal either. Uh, it, that's on town land where those jumps were, were uh, constructed. Uh, it's not on the forest preserve, so we don't have any serious concern over what they're planning to do. They are planning a lot of tree cutting to accommodate some changes for the uh, World University Games in 2023. We're a little concerned about the details of some of that. Mm. Um, the, not so much the tree cutting itself, but what types of uses they might make of the forest preserve that are not allowed right now. So I would suspect that between now and 2023, we will see a constitutional amendment that will allow some of the things to happen that will create sports venues and places where we already have existing things on the forest preserve, but they can't be expanded legally, mm. um, and to allow some of the accommodation for uh, the crowds that might take place as a result of uh, these games coming to the to the region. So they'll have to get voters' approval to. Uh, they will, and those I projects. think th this is something that can be worked out. The details will have to be uh, uh, negotiated, but it's certainly uh, possible and something that we uh, we are certainly not opposed to seeing happen, and we'll do everything we can to, to accommodate within the uh, uh, reasonable means of protecting the environment at the same time. And the APA is going to uh, visit the, uh, it's been working on the, the master plan. And uh, uh, with that now comes uh, the possibility that they may revisit, the state may revisit the uh, rail trail proposal between Tupper Lake and Lake Placid and turning those 34 miles of railroad tracks into a multi-use right. recreation trail. Have you folks all along, this has of course been an issue for several years now, have you taken a position on this through the years on, on converting that to a multi-use trail? We have not been opposed to that. In fact, we thought that that might be pretty good long-term for Tupper Lake uh, to be the end of the railroad and, uh, and, and also the end of the multi-use trail, that they would in many ways uh, hit the uh, economic jackpot with that. And that um, rail service between those two locations had not 
seemed to take off the way it had at the southern end of the railroad. Um, and we understood the reasons for the folks in Saranac Lake wanting to maintain the rail as well. Um, and uh, uh, frankly, wouldn't have had a problem with seeing that continue. But uh, this seemed like a solution that worked. Uh, it required a lot of compromise by a lot of different folks who had a, a stake in this. Um, and we're hoping that it will, it will continue to move forward in the, the way that it's been planned. Certainly there were some problems with state not owning the whole right of way. I think that's been cleared up now, but uh, it, the, anything is possible, I suppose. And with the travel corridor redefined, it, this may allow the state now to, to clear the way for the state to move ahead with its plans. That's right. And uh, uh, there is another section of railroad that we've been concerned about, North Creek, between there and the mines and Tahaz, that had become an oil train junkyard for a while. That's right. all been cleaned out now. There is a new buyer talking about purchasing that rail line and perhaps reinstating some rail traffic. Uh, we would be okay with that. Uh, if it doesn't materialize, uh, we want to uh, work with the community to try and find the best new use of that travel corridor. That may be a good place for rail bikes. It may be a good place for a hiking trail. Um, but the communities uh, around it really should have uh, uh, a say in how that is going to work and uh, the public in general ought to have a say because it's on the forest preserve and as we mentioned there, there are 19 million owners who ought to get a chance to uh, put their two cents in while everybody else is. Your biggest concern at the time was when the empty oil tankers were being stored there, the environmental threat primarily. Absolutely and uh, we're confident that the new owners will get the message that that is not welcome. We are hoping that the owners of the line, namely Warren County and the town of Corinth, make sure that they are aware of that and that uh, write it into any contract that comes up because that was left to a verbal agreement the last time and it didn't go so well. And uh, we're hoping that they're a little more savvy in the negotiations this time. John Sheehan, it's always good to see you. Thanks for being here. My pleasure, Tom.